Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum, respected colleagues and guests. Welcome to this month's Ummatics Colloquium. My name is Hannah Aisha and I'm Outreach Coordinator at Ummatics. We are excited to welcome everybody back after Ramadan, alhamdulillah, and to have our first regionally focused session entitled Shapers of Islam in Southeast Asia. One of the largest Muslim populations in the world today resides in Southeast Asia, with Indonesia taking the top spot as the most populous Muslim country. As such, the region has produced its own pedigree of reformers who have critiqued the limits of Islamic thought and, pro and proposed new lines of thinking on the road to constructing a better ummah. Additionally, the region being ethnically, religiously and developmentally diverse has given rise to a unique set of challenges for which Muslim intellectuals have attempted to arrive at creative solutions through a revival of ijtihad and through the adoption of a cosmopolitan outlook. As such, there is much that Islamic scholars can gain from learning about this experience and the contributions of intellectuals. In his recent book, Shapers of Islam in Southeast Asia, Dr. Khairuddin al Junaid attempts to capture the progressive and pluralistic nature of Islamic reformism in Southeast Asia from the mid 20th century onward. Offering a fresh conceptualization that could be applied to other parts of the Islamic world, the book shows how several influential Muslim intellectuals have given rise to an Islamic reformist mosaic, forming an alternative frame of thought to ultra traditionalist and ultra secularist leanings. From Najib al Atash and Usman Bakr to Ahmed Ibrahim and Kuntul Wijoyo, he provides a critical, comprehensive, and theoretically informed analysis of their contributions and examines how they uncovered the roots of educational backwardness, moral decadence, endemic authoritarianism, social injustice, and gender inequality that continue to plague Southeast Asia today. We're very grateful to have Dr. Khairuddin with us. Uh, Dr. Khairuddin is, of course, a principal research fellow at the University of Malaya and a senior fellow at Georgetown U University uh, and a senior fellow at the Al Walad bin Al Walid bin Talal Center for Muslim Christian Understanding at the Edmund A. Walsh School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University. He is formerly an associate professor at the, at the National University of Singapore. And he is the author of several books, including Muslim Cosmopolitanism, Southeast Asian Islam in Comparative Perspective, published by Edinburgh University Press, Hamka and Islam, Cosmopolitan Reform in the Malay World, published by Cornell University Press, and Islam in Malaysia, an Entwined History, published by Oxford University Press. His research covers topics such as religious cosmopolitanism, social movements, and intellectual history. We're also honored to be joined by three respondents for today. First, we have Dr. Shaza Shukri. Dr. Shaza is an associate professor of political science at the International Islamic University of Malaysia. Her area of specialization is in comparative politics, specifically in democratization and politics in the Middle East and Southeast Asia. Her current research interests include populism, identity politics, inter-ethnic re relations, political Islam, geopolitics, and gender studies, specifically in Muslim-majority contexts. Our second respondent is Dr. Saifuddin Dhuhri. Dr. Saifuddin is a lecturer at the State University for Religious Studies in Aceh, Indonesia. He's the author of numerous journal publications on Islamic theology, identity formation in Indonesia, and features of Southeast Asian Islam. And finally, we have Dr. Hasbi Aswar. Dr. Hasbi is an assistant professor of international relations at the Islamic University of Indonesia. He's also the head of the Indonesian Islamic Studies and International Relations Association, and has authored numerous journal publications on political Islamic movements in Indonesia. So I'm very excited for the discussion ahead today with the panel. As always, we'll hear from all of our speakers for the first hour and then move on to our Q&A session for the second hour. We also, we'd also like to encourage um, our attendees to join in the conversation in the general chat box and to submit any questions that they may have for the panelists uh, in the designated Q&A box throughout the session. Um, and we will get to those in the second hour. So without further ado, I'll hand over to um, you, Dr. Khairuddin, to start us off. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen wa salatu wa salamu ala ashrafil anbiya wal musaleen wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Um, I would like to share some slides. Maybe uh, you can uh, put me as a co-host and then I can um, turn on the slides for everybody to see, inshallah. Uh, first and foremost, thank you very much for inviting me for this Umatics Colloquium. 
uh, it is always very nice to have uh, Southeast Asian voices to be part and parcel of the discussion on the Ummah. Uh, and it's always the case, and I will talk about this later on, that whenever we talk about the Muslim Ummah, Southeast Asia is always last in the discussion. So the big point that I'm going to make today, aside from us uh, discussing about the book uh, that I've uh, published, is to talk about how important Islam in Southeast Asia is and how we need to shift our lenses from looking at only the Arab world, South Asia, North Africa, into looking at some of the ideas that we can um, benefit from, from Muslims in Southeast Asia. So the topic of um, the presentation today or the papers of Islam in Southeast Asia, but what I'm going to talk about is on the whole idea of the Islamic reformist mosaic. And the big point or the big idea that I want to put forth to everyone, I'm not going to take too much time because I would like to listen to the uh, respondents and the people who have read the book, is that we need to also redefine how we view Islamic reformism, not only in Southeast Asia, but globally. And the term Islamic reformist mosaic, I will uh, talk about this as we go along. Uh, there are four things that I want to focus on, and the last one will be very brief. The first is how and why we need to reposition Southeast Asian Islam in Ummatic history, why it is important for us to change our lenses and to change our perspectives on how we view the Ummah as whole, to look at the periphery as also part of uh, the core, and to look at Islam not only from this core periphery kind of perspective, but to understand that there were many cores within the Ummah, and that each core had contributed to the Ummah in one way or another, without denying the fact that Mecca remains our Qibla, that different Ummahs were there in the larger Ummah, and they all contributed to this making of the reformism that we're going to talk about. Secondly, I'm going to talk about uh, the, the, the approaches to Muslim thought and why there are so many problems in categorizations that we need to somehow question and overcome. And then I'm going to talk about the whole idea of the Islamic reformist mosaic. I would like to hear from the respondents about what they think about this idea. And it's always the case whenever I I'm invited for these kinds of conversation. Uh, whenever I get some good ideas from uh, the, the people who have engaged with my own work and other works as well, uh, I would basically use it as, uh, 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 as ideas for me to write another book. Uh, and then this is always the, the kind of um, thing that we do as scholars. And then I'm going to quickly introduce the seven strands of thought that I've discussed in the book. Now, let us begin first with the repositioning of Southeast Asian Islam in Ummatic history. As I said in the very beginning, uh, Malays, Indonesians, Javanese, Bugis, whoever that we find, there are more than 100, only 200 sub-ethnic groups in Southeast Asia. We have always been seen as the periphery or in a sense, just merely auxiliary to the whole history of, of Islam in the world. And... This is very, very problematic because if you look at uh, the numbers alone, there are more than 900 million Muslims living in the Asia Pacific. While even though Islam originated from the Arab world, there are only 317 million Muslims in the Arab world. We have 43 million Muslims in Europe right now and 248 million Muslims uh, in the sub-Saharan Africa. We have now Latin American Muslims, and the numbers are growing by the year. Islam is one of the fastest growing religion right now in South and in North America. But what's interesting is that there are only 3 million Muslims, 3.4 million Muslims in America. But when you look at the literature of the Ummah at large, a lot of the focus and attention right now are on North America because this whole American Islam thing is a big thing, partly due to figures such as Hamza Yusuf, Yasser Qadi, and, and others who have contributed, Nu'man Ali Khan, who, has, who, has, who have contributed a lot to the conversation on, on Islam, especially contemporary Islam, and of course on Islam in Europe, partly because of Islamophobia. It is a big issue right now, and they get uh, the large bulk of the attention in the media. 
And of course, as usual, Islam in the Middle East, there's always some, something happening in the Middle East that the world will be focused on. And whenever something is happening in North America and Europe, it has always to do with Muslims from the Middle East. So the Arab problem becomes the larger umatic problem. But what we don't realize is that there are a lot of things that are happening as well in the Asia Pacific. Yes, South Asian Muslims have been given a lot of coverage and we know a lot of South Asian thinkers, one of which, which, which has been discussed in so many works is Abu A'la al-Maududi and his Jamaati Islami. And of course, in Pakistan, there are also great thinkers like Iqbal and so forth and so forth. But nothing heard out when it comes to Southeast Asia. And whenever something is said about Southeast Asia, it is always about things related to policy and related to terrorism. So Southeast Asia is always seen as the second or third front of Al-Qaeda and so forth and so forth. So this I call as the problem of disproportionality that we are looking at the Ummah through the eyes that are through, through very imbalanced eyes and we need to correct this misperception. And in focusing our attention to Southeast Asia, we need to also understand that there have been a lot of works that have been written on Islam in Southeast Asia by both Muslims and non-Muslims. So if I can cite two of them, uh, of course, the, these, these works are useful because they reference the works that come before them. There are many other scholars such as Taib Usman, who was um, the VC, the Vice Chancellor of University of Malaya, which I am currently based in. And of course, Sayyid Naqib al -Attas, which has been discussed in the book. But the book by Anthony Milner on the Malays basically gives us a general outline of how the Malays in Southeast Asia, including all other Malays, uh, have contributed to the making of Islam in the region. And of course, the book by Osman Bakar, who is part and parcel of the Shapers of Islam that I talked about, talked about how there was a civilization with its own peculiar characteristics that had developed in Southeast Asia. And this civilization had also contributed to the larger Ummatic civilization as a whole. So there are a lot of stuff that have been coming out. Uh, one unfortunate tragedy of us in Southeast Asia is that even though there are a lot of material that has been written, many of the works by scholars in Southeast Asia do not engage, and if I can criticize them, with theoretical issues that affect the Ummah as a whole. And this has resulted to us being seen as people who are only collecting data and not scholars who are giving this wider viewpoint about how should we see the Ummah. So the problem is not only because the Ummah is not looking at us or scholars from the outside is not looking, are not looking at our story of Islam in Southeast Asia. The problem, the way I see it, has to do with the fact that Southeast Asian scholars themselves do not try to push the boundaries of the thinking about the Ummah in ways that would bring the attention to this part of the world. And the problem is also has to do with language. A lot of the writings of great scholars that I discuss in my book are in Bahasa Indonesia and Bahasa Melayu. It is, they, they write largely in the vernacular other than Osman Bakar, Siza Maju Adib, uh, Ahmad Ibrahim, and Senakri Balatas. Most of his scholars basically write in the local languages. And partly because of that, and partly because of the lack of this process of translation, uh, we do not get access to many of these works. So what I have been trying to do before we talk about shapers of Islam in Southeast Asia is to globalize the thinking of Muslims in this part of the world to the rest of the world. A lot of some scholars have criticized that criticized me for publishing in Western outlets, saying that when you do that, you are basically trying to appeal to a Western audience. My counter argument is that we need to write and publish in Western outlets, or in fact, in Arabian ones, or even in Pakistani or Indian ones, because we want them to be exposed to our ideas. So rather than consuming what comes from the outside, we in so-called the periphery should be publishing where the metropolitan publishers are. And in that way, we get the attention from that part of the world. So I wrote basically, it was meant to be just a book of 200 words, uh, 200 pages. In the end, it has become a project that has stretched for 1,000 pages. So I wrote 
Muslim cosmopolitanism to show how unique Islam in Southeast Asia is. But then I realized that it's not enough to say how unique. We need to show that there are great thinkers. And that's why I wrote the book on Hamka, who wrote 118 books in a very short lifetime of 73 years old. And then to show that we have a long history, I wrote the book Islam in Malaysia, to show that Islam in Southeast Asia is as long as the Islams that you see in other parts of the world. Of course, there's only one Islam. There's no many Islam. But the kind of manifestation of Islam is as long as you see in other parts of the world. And recently, I edited a book to show, and this is a book that is... Um, that, that consists of a collection of essays with 23 other scholars, experts on Islam in Southeast Asia, that Islam, Southeast Asian Islam is far from peripheral in the wider terrain of global Islam or Ummatic Islam. Rather, studying Muslims in Southeast Asia could provide us with windows to understanding how one of the fastest growing religions has embedded itself deeply in local societies while exhibiting universality, inclusivity and shared features with Islamic expressions and manifestations found elsewhere. So I think a lot of work needs to be done, especially by scholars who are Muslims themselves, who want to try and project their own interpretations of Southeast Asia, Southeast Asia Islam to the rest of the world. Now, if I'm moving too quickly, please tell me. Now, having done that, having globalized this whole study of Islam in Southeast Asia, we need then to be more critical of the categorizations that have been used because any study of anything, especially of Islam, begins with understanding of concepts because the wrong usage of concepts leads to the wrong understanding of reality. And what I have done in this book, uh, and I hope the, the, the respondents will tell me whether it's convincing enough, is to challenge what we call as the either or's or the left and right in many of the categorizations that we see in works on Islam. Uh, whenever we read things on Islam, not only in Southeast Asia, you see this modern versus traditional uh, uh, dichotomy and binary. When you wear hijab, you are traditional. When you don't wear hijab, you are modern. You see this whole progressive and regressive uh, binary that has been set up. Uh, when you do not accept that uh, Islam is the only religion that could bring you to heaven, you are progressive. But when you do and you assert the superiority of Islam above all religions, then you are regressive. So these kind of dichotomies, conservative and radical, and of course, fundamentalist and secularist. Fundamentalist bad, secularist good. Fundamentalist regressive, secularist progressive. And all of these binaries and dich dich uh, dichotomization has led to a misunderstanding of how Islam has been expressed by Muslims, especially in Southeast Asia. Because if you look at someone like Hamka on the subject of women, he's very, very ultra-modern. On the subject of fiqh, for example, he can be very so-called traditional in his interpretation. So he is of many categorization. But the problem with the scholarship that we see out there is that you need to exist in a continuum. And this is the, the continuum approach to Islam is to me very, very pro problematic. Like Clinton Bennett in his book, Muslims and Modernity, talks about you're either a progressive or you're a radical revisionist. You're either a new traditionalist or you're a traditionalist, but you can't be all of them. Now, the interesting thing about the thinkers in Southeast Asia is that they do not subject themselves to boxes. They do not exists in just one categorization. It depends on the issue that we are talking about. It depends on the context that we are talking about. And it depends on the kind of engagements with certain communities, certain ideas, certain um, problems that would lead them to take different kinds of position. And it, it is especially so in this part of the world where thinkers in Southeast Asia are able to draw on different ideas and try to fuse them together to come up with a new dynamic of their own. Right. Uh, so that brings me to the categorization that I that I brought up in the book. I wish to actually cite a, a Western scholar who said very, very clearly in his book, the terms that Westerners have used do not render any services to a serious study of a variety in social radiation and interaction or to any understanding of the interests, motivations and intentions guiding the adherence. And when he talks about adherence, He's talking basically about Muslims as, as actors. He said, when you look at Islam or Muslims 
in its lived form in society, many of the categorizations that we have used do not help us to understand what Muslims are doing, are thinking, and are expressing their religion. That leads us very quickly, and I'm going to end very, very quickly here, to the whole idea of the Islamic reformist mosaic. Now, why did I introduce this term as part and parcel of trying to understand the thinkers in Southeast Asia? And of course, this is in the book, Shapers of Islam in Southeast Asia. Now, there is a paperback edition that has been published in Malaysia. And um, I hope that everyone would get a, a copy and please criticize as much uh, as you can uh, the ideas that are there. And I truly appreciate it. Now, when we talk about Islamic reformists, we are talking first about the genealogical idea of what reformism is. So when I use the word the, the words Islamic reformist mosaic, I'm talking about first a long and unbroken line of Fakan scholarship that derives its inspiration from two foundational sources. So I want to make this very, very clear for anyone who is not a Muslim, that when we study Islam, all interpretations of Islam can or should be collapsed under the sources of Islam that is foundational. And that those sources are the Quran and the Sunnah. And this is very, very important because whenever people look at Islamic reformism, they try to argue that one can be a reformist supra Quran or supra the Sunnah. And I'm saying that this is not how Muslims actually view their own religion. Uh, but more importantly, when we talk about Islamic reformists, it is about the intent of reform, islah, and renewal of the Muslim way of life. And this reform is not something that is current. There is a genealogy to it. Every Muslim reformer derives from a reformer before him, before him, and all the way to the first reformer, which is Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And we need to understand first the genealogical uh, aspect of the idea of Islamic reformism. Now, secondly, when we talk about Islamic reformists, we need to look at it from a dialogical angle, and this is something that I'm this I have discussed uh, in my upcoming book. There's a book that's come coming out. Uh, by the end of the year, and I hope maybe by the beginning of next year, it's on Sufism in Southeast Asia, where I talk about Sufism as a dialogical tradition, a tradition that engages with text and context. So when we talk about Islamic reformists, we are also talking about a style of thought that rethinks commonly held ideas about Islam as both a belief system and a lived reality. This necessitates dynamic interactions between text and context, to offer innovative solutions to problems confronting Muslim societies. So it's not about referring to the things that happened before us. Reformers don't only refer to the people before them, they also engage in a dialogue with society. So there are people who embed themselves into society and try to figure out new ideas, new ways of looking at the society at present in order to provide solutions for the future. Why do I use the word mosaic? And this is one good book that you can look at. It's just a conversation uh, between Perry Anderson and, and one uh, scholar of Islam. Uh, a lot of the ideas there, I disagree with a lot of the ideas there, but I think the whole idea of the mosaic is very, very interesting because it captures the fact that when we talk about reformism, there are many strands of reformism, especially in Southeast Asia and in the larger Muslim world. Each strand basically drew from the other to form a unified and coherent frame of thought. So even though Hamka, or sorry, or even though uh, Alatas may not be in sync or agree with the ideas of Kunto Wijoyo, or Kunto Wijoyo may not agree with the, uh, with the ideas of Ahmad Ibrahim, all of these ideas basically form a coherent frame. They are all interested in reforming the Ummah, especially the Ummah in Southeast Asia. They are mosaics in the sense that they are different from one another. But if you look at them, not from the perspective of the trees, but as a forest as a whole, you can see that they come together as one. So the, the word mosaic captures the reality that Islamic reformism in Southeast Asia was scarcely divorced from the society at large, much like pieces of decorative materials that are permanently affixed and eventually become of a given become part of a given surface the muslim reformism uh, muslim intellectuals described in the book were initially seen as outsiders and outliers but they soon affected changes in their own society so 
why this whole idea of mosaic is very, very interesting because whenever re a reformer comes out with his ideas, these ideas are usually not accepted by the society or they are seen as marginal to that society. But soon enough, many of the ideas are accepted. So if you look at many of the thinkers in the book, especially Zakia Darajat, when she started out her work trying to reform society, trying to popularize this whole idea of ilmu jiwa agama, a religious oriented psychology, people were not keen on that because the, the society that she was in in the 1960s was, was very, very secularized. But soon enough, after years and years of reformist work, many of her ideas became mainstream. And this is why the word mosaic becomes very, very important because it is not only a matter of introducing a new concept, but rather to capture the fact that Islamic reformism has in itself diversity, but also unity uh, in, in, in thought and in perspective. So I looked at seven thinkers in the book, and Nakib Alatas uh, is what I call as the de-secularist, one who wants to move beyond secularism. Haruna Susyon is the rationalist who tries to give a new rational perspective of what Islam is. Punto Wijoyo, the historicist who uses history as a way to reform society. Siza Adib Majul, a Filipino, talks about the integration between minorities and majorities in the Philippines, but also in Southeast Asia. Osman Bakar talked about the importance of the theory of knowledge, why we need to unite knowledge rather than bificate it as has been done by the secular worldview. Zakia Darajat, who talks about the importance of morality in reforming society. And last but not least, the very famous thinker, especially in Malaysia and Singapore, Ahmad Ibrahim, who talks about bringing back the Sharia. And when he talks about bringing back the Sharia, it is not the Sharia as we understand it in the medieval time or in the Arab world, but a Sharia that is sensitive to the conditions of Muslims in Southeast Asia. So I'm going to just end here. Actually, I want to hear more than, than I want to speak today. So I really uh, welcome as, uh, as many critiques as possible of the book. And I give it back to our dear uh, chairman. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Khairuddin, for, for starting us off there and giving a very great, a great context around the place of South e Southeast Asian scholarship within the broader scholarship of the Muslim world, as well as some insights into your book there. Um, we'll head then to our first respondent, inshallah, Dr. Sheza. Um, when you're ready. All right, thank you, Aisha. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh to everyone. Um, such a great presentation and obviously such a good book. Uh, uh, I enjoyed reading it, obviously, and thank you so much to Prof. Karidin for sharing your ideas with us today as well uh, in this colloquium. Um, I'm not sure if my comments are more of a critique, it's just like, the thoughts that came to my mind while I was reading the book front to back. Um, firstly, obviously, I'm, I'm going to be a little bit biased in my comments in the sense that I agree mostly uh, with the things that you wrote in the sense that just as you started off in your presentation earlier, talking about how Islam and Southeast Asia, unfortunately, have been seen uh, as more of the periphery in the larger Muslim world. Uh, with the Middle East seen as, as more of the center uh, for the Muslim world and as someone from islands of East Asia, I appreciate uh, your book uh, in bringing together all of these ideas of these reformist Muslim thinkers um, in the region. For me, again, I, I agree with you that just because Islam uh, began or it was preached early on, um, started early on in the Middle East, it doesn't make the rest of us, including Southeast Asia, to take on a secondary position. So I think that was a, an important point, I think, that you're making. Um, it obviously belies the important tenet of our religion, which is its universality, just like you mentioned earlier. Um, so there is this importance uh, of, of bringing uh, thoughts and scholarship from Southeast Asia to the larger um, discussion on Islam, the, the discourse on Islam uh, in the world today, especially. Um, 
of course for me Islam um, doesn't belong to any specific group and more than that it is flexible I think that's the key there, isn't it? That is flexible. It can accommodate various views and traditions, including the one that we have in Southeast Asia. The thing is, um, because of this whole Middle East being the center for us, I see contemporarily, especially that there is this decide this, this confusion, I guess, between uh, on identity. Um, what I'm trying to say is that. Um, we need to differentiate when it is religion and when it is cultural. Uh, specifically in Southeast Asia, uh, I'm sure most of the panelists would agree that we are seeing uh, in our parts of the world um, this growing Arabization, whereby um, Arabic culture is seen somehow as being purer or even more Islamic uh, comparatively to our local traditions. Um, for me, of course, this is in a way sad because if you look at history of Southeast Asia, um, Islam was not just tolerated, but it was also celebrated alongside our local traditions, right? The, the traditions that have been here for hundreds of years. And this is because when Islam came to our part of the world, um, we already had thriving civilizations. So I think this is part of the larger conversation that Islam came and it flourished alongside all of these others that we already have. Um, so for me, there is definitely no impediment for us to maintain this, this tolerance, this respectful stance um, that we have for various traditions, um, even going into the 21st century, we should maintain it. Um, in the book, Prof. Gaiden shows that thinkers from outside of the Middle East definitely contributed a lot to Islamic thinking and worldview, especially, of course, we're talking about Southeast Asian thinkers today. And I think, and I believe this is the essence of the umatic endeavor that most of us are interested in today. We are not trying to build a homogeneous Islam, neither a hegemonic Islam, right? We're, what we're trying to do is try to create this Islam that allows people of all sorts of background to come together under one uh, banner, which is Islam. Just like Prokhardin just mentioned earlier, that there is one Islam, that, that, but there are multiple manifestations. And this, I think, is what we need to celebrate right in, in, today. Um, looking at the importance and uniqueness of Southeast Asia, especially I was thinking of uh, the chapter on Marjo, uh, and also Prof mentioned earlier that it is not a simple bifurcation of Muslim and non-Muslim world, Muslim and non-Muslim history, Muslim and non-Muslim law, right? This is um, the result of colonization, secularization um, that happened before the 20th century and going into the 20th century. So in the book, uh, Prof. Kalidin shows that how Muslim reformers took the lead in forming a more holistic living history of, of Islam in Southeast Asia that saw Muslims and Islam interacting um, with other civilizations and how because of these interactions, human history have actually improved because they brought heart, soul and also Islam into a more materialistic world that, that we transitioned into a uh, hundred years before. Um, so while Southeast Asian thinkers, reformers have been uh, influenced by Muslim and non-Muslim thinkers from other parts of the world, there is no doubt. They definitely um, participated, not just participated, they improved our understanding of Islam, our understanding, our worldview as well. And in the book's conclusion, um, Prof mentioned that the West brought both negative and positive influences to us and the rest of the world. And I agree that we need to utilize our intellectual capacities to sift through history and to realize that both the West and the Muslim world have a whole great deal of improvement to be made still. So as a political scientist, um, of course, my reading of the book is you know, filtered through that lens mostly. Um, but like Prof already shows us that he actually goes into 
multiple angles, right? From law to history to epistemology, knowledge and psychology. But from my own interest um, in politics and relating it to the flexibility of Islam that we were talking about, I can't help but stress the off-sighted point that Islam doesn't have a hierarchical or a central authority, especially in Sunni Islam. What this means, the important point is that um, everyone or anyone with enough knowledge, enough familiarity with the religious text can perform ishtihad or a new interpretation um, to help us overcome new challenges uh, in the modern world. Uh, I think this is one of the more important points in the book, right? That there are competing and multiple voices um, when it comes to Muslim reformers in Southeast Asia. And I believe just like uh, Prof showed us earlier, that's why he used the term mosaic uh, to show that they're different, but they fit into the larger picture. And for me, it's not just larger picture of Islam and Southeast Asia, right? But um, Islam as a whole. I, I, I want to talk about this point because I see today that when we have competing voices and different opinions, sometimes mm -hmm. or most of the times today, this is seen as a negative aspect of our religion, when we know that if we love, it's not really a problem. Um, but for political reasons, like I said, as I mentioned, bringing in from my political, from my uh, point of view, um, differences of opinion have led Muslims to be cynical and worse than that, suspicious of one another. And for me, this is obviously the opposite of the umatic agenda that uh, we are embarking on. Whereas when we look at the book, the Muslim reformers that were mentioned, they were among those who were actually brave enough to go against, not to go against, but to challenge certain prevalent or mainstream ideas, such as uh, Nasution, uh, who was mentioned the whole chapter. Um, but they did so with the right intention, right? Um, based on both reason and revelation. And I think this is what we need to celebrate. A rigid homogeneity, for me, is the cause of disunity in the Muslim world because there's no space for discourse. There's no space for debate. Whereas I think uh, the Umatic project should be based on the idea of unity in diversity, right? So how can this be done? Uh, Prof. Kari didn't talk about how these reformers, you know, they went down from the, the ivory tower. They went to, to the masses to help reshape society in a way that they view is, is uh, as important as how modern Muslims should be uh, in their own society, while still being anchored in the Quran and Sunnah. But when I was reading that part, I was just curious. Um, and I know Prof mentioned that, you know, we should stop this whole dichotomy. But how is it that when these reformers came down to the masses, how do they fend off the um, pressure that they might feel from the political elite, from society as well? Um, meaning that my question is, how do they balance this reform agenda and not being you know, carried by the type of what the people want? So that's one question that I may have. Um, I do understand that when these reformers participate in activism, they're not just paying lip service um, to what is Islam, right? It is not um, enough to say that Islam is the truth. It's not enough to shout that Sharia is to me. There is a need to show how is it that Muslim law, Muslim education, Muslim way of life um, is much better in practical terms. Uh, and I believe the chapter on Ahmad Ibrahim was in this light as well. There is the practical aspect in which da'wah is beyond just preaching, right? It's, it's about, it's through actions, it's through our exemplary actions. For me, if Muslim society, and especially Muslim majority nations, such as Indonesia and Malaysia that we have in, in, in Southeast Asia, can show that Muslim leaders can be just, fair, compassionate, there will come the day, I believe, that um, we no longer have to shout and scream that Sharia is the way, right? People can see it and we need to show it, starting from the lowest level of the family, of the individual, all the way to national politics one day, inshallah. So as a political scientist that studies contemporary development, um, I do have some questions uh, on the book. Um, 
which is that there is fear today that a lot of Muslims, especially the political class, are uh, only paying lip service to Islam as an identity. What I meant is that um, Islam has become more of an identity marker as opposed to a deen, a way of life, right? This is, of course, some have argued to be the outcome of the outward Islamization um, that was spearheaded, for example, by Prof. Naki Palatas. Um, of course, it's commendable, right, to, to coax, to bring people into the way of Islam. But like the book mentioned in the chapter on Zakia, which I really like, which is that too much of it can also be an obsession. And, and I feel that politically, especially, um, this obsession has led people to use Islam to scare people um, into supporting certain political ideas. Um, and I think this is the opposite of what the reformers are trying to do, which is that trying to reform the minds of Muslims um, so that they can think for themselves, right? So I feel that the efforts of these reformist Muslim thinkers in Southeast Asia have been taken over by those with narrow political interests. So I'll just end my comment by asking, you know, how do we move from this more fatalistic and absolutist mindset that in a way we're seeing on the rise today, um, when we try to bring this, this discussion to the masses, it, it always brings about very strong emotional reaction. How, would, how do we continue <laughs> basically this, this reformist agenda? Uh, because I feel that the tide has turned uh, right now. So I'll end there. Thank you so much. And back to you, Aisha. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Shazza. You've raised some really interesting questions there, and I'm seeing other interesting questions also being put in the in, in the chat box. Um, obviously, feel free to discuss these um, among yourself um, to the attendees. But for those that you do want the, the 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 panelists to address here today, do put them in the Q and A box as well, because there's a lot of kind of conversations going on in the general chat box. It will be difficult for us to scroll through at the time, but we'll be able to see them much more clearly in the Q&A box. So put them both in, in, in both boxes, um, in both chat boxes, if you're unsure. Um, but thank you so much again, Dr. Shadda, for starting the conversation. Um, we'll come now to um, Dr. Saifuddin. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Do you hear me? Wa alaikum salam. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, okay. thank you very much. <laughs> well, first of all, I'm really thankful for uh, Ummatic uh, Institute for inviting me to be the correspondent of uh, my brother, Fayruddin. I think uh, he's a really great person, and I also uh, have read of his book for several time, and uh, I found his books really interesting, not just this book, but for other books that I use for my reference, for my writings. And also, I'm really thankful for all our friends here. Um, I'm, I'm not uh, the one that I should uh, give comment in the best way, but I'm thinking that um, this uh, moment is um, um, I'm, I'm going to use for my learning process. Um, uh, reading uh, Sheikh Heruddin book, um, really happy, and I have some uh, comments on it. First of all, um, uh, when I hear his presentation on the concept of mosaic and cosmopolita, cosmopolitanism, and he said that the wrong understanding of concept will lead to the wrong understanding of the reality, I agree for this, and I think that concept is really important for uh, writing, especially in Islamic world. And uh, uh, I, just to comment on the concept of uh, Islamic reform, of reformism, um, I'm wondering about the word, uh, the concept of Islamic in Islamic reformism. For example, when we talk about Islamic thought, for example, there are many theories on it. I mean, there are theories that ground on the definition of Islamic or Islamic thought. For example, some ideas say that Islamic and Islamic thought is uh, the, the way of thinking that is only based on uh, Islamic origin uh, uh, and uh, Islamic, uh, uh, for example, Al-Quran and Hadith. And, but the second one said that, uh, 
uh, Islamic can be seen as Islamic thought if this is uh, originated originated on Islamic on Islamic issue on Islamic uh, background. For example, when we talk about Islam within the framework of Islamic civilization, it means that uh, it is Islamic. For example, some uh, scholar which are not Muslim and they talk about Islam and they respond about Islamic issue, they still keep uh, referring him as Islamic uh, thinker or Islamic, uh, for example, Islamic reformist or, or something else categories. And the idea of this also, when uh, uh, Brother Khairuddin used the word uh, mosaic and cosmopolitan, cosmopolitanism, I also sometimes um, thinking about uh, the debate between uh, Salafism and uh, traditionalism, for example, between Ibn Taymiyyah and some of uh, uh, traditionalists, for example, like Ash'arism and some and something else. They talk about when they, they refer to Islamic philosophy, some say that Islamic philosophy is only Islamic, uh, that philosophy is based on Al Quran and Hadith. So, the, so that uh, they reject something like uh, uh, Ibn Rush and Averos and Avicin, Ibn Sina, and other thoughts of philosophy, Islamic philosophy, and they say that they're not Islamic because of they use uh, a Greek uh, method of uh, Ilmu Mantek or Silologism. But uh, the only Islamic uh, philosophy is only something referred to uh, Islam source, like a Quran and Hadith and tradition and Atta, something like that. So in this way, uh, they say that uh, the only Islamic philosophy is only uh, Ilmu Kalam and uh, like Usulfik and something else. So this uh, idea is really received great attention and has uh, grown to Ibn Tamiya Aida and Salafism. Uh, to refer to what uh, your uh, definition of Islamic, of Islamic reformism, I'm um, thinking that what, when you use, uh, you reborrow the concept of mosaic and cosmopolitanism, I think it's, uh, I mean, the best way to, to, uh, to get rid of, uh, uh, I mean, uh, something like uh, traditional and something like uh, heritage, heritage that we are trapped in in the debate that, is, that has not any uh, uh, give good solution, uh, good, has not, I mean, uh, counter production for Islamic thinking. And I think this idea is very genius and excellent. Um, I really appreciate your, your way to use mosaic and cosmopolitan that is, uh, has great uh, grown to uh, Islamic civilization and the work, the work of art uh, like, uh, uh, so it's actually an art that uh, has really uh, a reach of uh, uh, what we call is uh, accommodation between local um, uh, heritage of art and Arabic art, uh, Turkish art and Persian art. And also uh, there are some art also borrowed from Hinduism, from uh, pre-Islamic uh, Art of uh, dynamism and animism. So I think uh, for this uh, uh, attempt, I um, really appreciate your your way to 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 redefine, to give fresh definition of Islamic reformism. But there are some obstacles. I think some I mean some challenges to 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 be addressed. For example, uh, what do you think if? Uh, this the definition of Islamic reformism. Uh, uh, what is the just to refer to uh, Ash'ari's uh, uh, tradition when they give a definition of everything, even in Aqidah, in Islamic theology or Islamic faith, they use uh, a philologium or a mantek uh, uh, approach, and they use uh, two concepts, two principles in definition. For example, the first principle is. Uh, what is Jami and what is the money between the reformism? For example, most of the scholars or the reformists that you include in your book uh, are, has the background from uh, Western civilization or Western education, educating, education background. For example, Punto Vigero, even, uh, I mean, the most uh, uh, great one, uh, the critical scholar that I, I consider in your book is she has no people at us. He also has a Western background. So 
in this way, how to respond uh, the definition with that uh, 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 that offered by uh, Sheikh Abdul Razik and Sheikh Sami Nashar and also by uh, Hassan Hanafi to say that Islamic thought or Islamic it's, it's only Islamic that is only based on Islamic tradition and Islamic that is a Quran and Hadith that exclude of uh, Western civilization. In this way, I think uh, it is important to, to address this way. I'm sorry because I cannot uh, uh, see uh, even further of your definition because the book that um, I comment right now, I have not uh, read it the whole, just uh, find it on the Oxford's website and try to understand from the abstract, the abstract of the chapters. So please forgive me if my comment just uh, uh, neglect that they, they're already there, the, the limitation and the framework of the uh, conceptual framework of the of your uh, the, uh, your definition. Second one, um, and also uh, interesting. I mean, I'm really interested to your uh, 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 choice of the person. Uh, you choose you choose about seven person like Naoki, uh, Zaki Raja, Kunto Wijoyo, and uh, Osman Osman uh, Osman Ibrahim and others person. Um, uh, I don't know what is your uh, criteria or what is your uh, uh, justification of those person as the representative representative of uh, reformism in Southeast Asia. I think there are a lot of people there in South Asia which has great influential uh, contact in South Asian Islam. For example, uh, I, I all I mean when I studied about uh, autobiography, I just to refer to three uh, main things. For example, uh, their background of uh, thinking, education, something like that, and what they thought, and then what is his influential aspect and. This is I just uh, want to uh, I mean uh, to to offer uh, 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 just to address uh, and concern about what is uh, the influence uh, of those uh, person in uh, Southeast Asia context, uh, particularly on 20s and 21st century of Southeast Asian Islam. For example, in Indonesia, you include like uh, um, uh, Zakir Rajan. Uh, I personally really happy with him, and I have similar background of education with uh, with her. Um, I read I read many of her books, and also your include Kunto with Joyo. Uh, but why, for example, you don't uh, include there someone like uh, Azumadi Asra and Amin Abdullah, for example? Both of them has great influence on Indonesian high education for uh, Indonesian Islamic education there. For example, Amin Abdullah has uh, the paradigm of uh, Jaring Laba Laba, Web Spider, and also Amin Abdul uh, Azumar also like uh, uh, his, his own paradigm, like uh, what uh, Naqib al Assas do in uh, Malaysia. And for another one, for example, in uh, reality, I mean, in a practical context, for example, the one has great influence in Aceh, for example, for applying for the application of Sharia in Aceh. Many refer to Sharia in Aceh uh, only uh, like uh, political discourse, but actually there's uh, like intellectual person, an intellectual discourse that uh, refer to one person like uh, uh, Aliasa Abu Bakar. Aliasa Abu Bakar has great uh, thinking and uh, some of his publication mostly on in Indonesian language, but he thought on a formulation of Islamic uh, application in Aceh has great impact and has a uh, big impact on uh, legal realization in Aceh. I mean, just to refer to another person that you include in your book as legalist, but uh, in practical context, the person that you refer, uh, for me, I mean, I'm sorry, I'm very humble person and maybe my reading is very uh, limited and have no enough knowledge to uh, I mean, to assess this uh, this way, but because I really I mean happy to be part of this uh, 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 this this moment, and I really I'm really honored to my brothers 
Khairuddin, I just want to, to say this because maybe it benefit, uh, it give beneficial uh, comment to your book. And uh, I also hear that you are going to expand your book to be more than 1,000 uh, <laughs> pages. I, uh, if I can give advice, please uh, uh, give attention to Prof. Alia Saubakar. I think it's good uh, for uh, Dr. Yeah. Dr. Sabathine, if you could just, we've got about a minute or so, if you could, if you could wrap up. You've shared some really interesting thoughts, but we're just running a bit tight on time. Okay, thank you. I'm, I'm just finishing. No, no, feel free to finish, finish. Finish your last point, please. Finish your last point. Okay. Okay. Um. Uh. So this is my my thinking about the scholar, and um, I don't know, but uh, I'm really happy for this and. Your definition with principle on based on Al-Quran and Sunnah, Tajdid and Islam is really good. And I, I'm, I'm wondering if I can uh, read those uh, book and maybe I'm going uh, to save my mind to, to, buy, to buy the book. And I recommend for everyone here and the others to buy the book. And it's really very beneficial for, uh, I mean, for uh, developing Islamist intellectuality in South East Asia. Thank you very much for this time. Sorry for the time. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you so much, Dr. Saifuddin. Um, you weren't to, um, going over time anyway. You're perfectly on time, alhamdulillah. Um, we look forward as well to hearing the thoughts of some of our respondents in the Q&A as well to many of the questions. And you raised some really interesting points there. So I'm sure Dr. Khaydudin would like to respond. Um, just a note as well to our attendees that we will be running a couple of polls um, just on some of the points that have been raised by the respondents. So you can uh, vote in them and also share your thoughts um, in, in, in the Q&A box, um, in the chat box, sorry. And last but not least, anyway, we will come to our final respondent, um, Dr. Hasbi, um, over to you. Thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Alhamdulillah, salatu wassalamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa ashabiya jama'in ambadu. Dear participants and respected speakers, uh, as uh, I'm the last uh, respond, respondent for this uh, session, so uh, let me make it uh, brief, I think, yes, because I think most of the response that I actually will deliver today uh, were uh, were uh, explained by uh, both of the respondents, uh, Dr. Sepudin and Dr. Zaza. And first of all, I would like to um, congratulate Dr. Khairuddin. I think this is my first time to meet Dr. Khairuddin. And uh, Dr. Khairuddin, uh, I'm actually also a new scholar, a new researcher. Yeah, I'm not, uh, I, I cannot, uh, I cannot say that I'm a scholar because, you know, uh, I have uh, just, uh, you know, completed my uh, PhD just uh, Two years or three years ago, and Dr. Dr. Shaza Zukri uh, was, you know, uh, was my examiner for uh, my uh, PhD uh, thesis. And actually, I have the same uh, concern with uh, Dr. Hairuddin that, you know, uh, when I was doing my PhD thesis, I um, I work on his Wutare in Indonesia, and uh, and when when I was doing my research, I saw that. So many actually interesting issues in uh, in, in this region, and it this needed to be uh, discussed, to be shared, to be introduced to the to the global publics. But unfortunately, uh, most of uh, you know most of our scholars in in our region, I think, are not still interested to discuss the thing. So I think we have the same concern, Dr. Hyderabad, and I and I also think that we have still so many. A scholar, so many important figures, and um, to that needed to be discussed, like what uh, Dr. Sebudin has mentioned. We have uh, Dr. Professor Azumar Di Azra, who work on uh, the history of uh, uh, ulama, ulama in um, in Middle East and in Southeast Asia, for example. We have also some uh, Muslim political thinkers and figures like Muhammad Amin Rais, and we have also. I think many uh, uh, many other uh, prominent thinkers and scholars that I think we need to discuss and to introduce their their, their thinking. So this the first point. Uh, the second point is that uh, after reading uh, or after scanning, yeah, because it is the first time I think I I, I read Dr. Herodin's book and I'm very interested with the with the book, and I know. Uh, very well, uh, some of the scholars that you choose to discuss in the books, like 
Prof. Nakib Alata, saya uh, Dr. Osman Bakar, for example, Dr. Kontuwijoyo, uh, including also uh, Professor Haruna Sution. And I agree, actually, especially for the three uh, scholars, yeah, that I uh, know them very well, like uh, Prof. Nakib Alata, Osman Bakar, and Kontuwijoyo, and and I see. And I know them uh, very well that they, you know, try to uh, make a new uh, concepts or uh, to conceptualize uh, Islamic teaching or Islamic ideas to uh, try to answer the current condition. But uh, especially, pro especially for uh, Professor Haruna Sutin, Anna Sutin, it is, I think, uh, become a special issue for me, uh, Dr. Harudin, yeah. Despite we know that uh, he is, a uh, yeah, we can say that he is a reformist, Muslim reformist, but in Indonesia itself, uh, he is well known, of, uh, especially from uh, some of the people who criticize him. He is well known, well known as, a, you know, as a liberal man, not, not just a reformist, but as a liberal man and uh, uh, a fanatic followers of Mutazili ideas. As you know, that Mutazili uh, put a ratio or rationality of a, of a wahyu of her Islamic revelation. And it makes even his colleague, uh, like Professor Daud Rashid, that is still now becoming uh, the lecturer in Islamic State University in Jakarta, he said that so many uh, you know, religious arguments coming from Haruna Sution is mostly similar uh, with the uh, Western Oriental instances. Uh, it is actually become also um, my question to you. So, uh, what makes you think that uh, Dr. Haruna Sutian is a reformist or is the one who always inspired by uh, Islamic revelation or Islamic uh, main sources to produce the uh, ideas? And it uh, will also become my second point, Dr. Uh, Hairuddin. Um, I have, for, in my opinion, uh, I, I think it will be, yeah, we, I think we need to be more careful, I think, if we make like a, a new term on Islam or Muslim society, I, I agree that uh, it, it becomes uh, more problematic if we put like uh, the idea of a progressive, a progressive Muslim, radical Muslim and so on. Because for me, in, from, from me and from, uh, from me and from my political background, it is actually, uh, it actually comes from a very political motif, yeah? Rather than intellectual motive, but when I try to analyze your, uh, you know, your your term on uh, Islamic reformism, I find also the same problematic thing. You know, um, when the liberal or secular uh, intellectual come, uh, intellectuals come and they uh, offer their knowledge, for example, their idea, they claim themselves as reformists too, reformist Muslim. Even they uh, say that I'm not only reformist, but I'm progressive Muslim, I'm inclusive Muslim and so on. And if we go back, for example, uh, some uh, centuries or um, before we see a Salafi movement, for example, or Wahhabi movement in uh, Saudi Arabia, they also come that they also call themselves as uh, Mujaddid or reformists. So it, uh, for me, uh, need need to be you know need to be uh, elaborated more need to be uh, make it more clearly uh, how to how to make reformists is different from uh, uh, traditionalists or is different from uh, liberal Muslim because you know both traditionalists and liberal Muslim use the term uh, reformist to uh, you know to to spread or to disseminate the idea. Um, the last thing, the last point that I will uh, I will respond to uh, Dr. Hadrudin today is uh, when you share your slide about uh, what makes Muslim in this region uh, is understudied uh, when we are actually majority uh, people in this world, right? I think it is not, I think I agree that uh, one, uh, one factor may be because of we are lack of motivation. I think I agree with that. Yeah, so we need to motivate scholars in this region to study, to make research on Islam in Southeast Asia, including the figures and so on. But on the other hand, I think there are also some, uh, some uh, technical aspects or even poli pol political issues that makes us still uh, marginalized in terms of, uh, uh, you know, in, in terms of uh, Islamic research in the global uh, discourse, for example. 
Uh, I will uh, try to make, uh, I'll, I'll try to give one example in this a very recent issue in Indonesia. Uh, you know, so, so many surveys, uh, so many surveys, yeah, or polling now in Indonesia shows that Indonesian Muslim or Indonesian people today is afraid or is, you know, is more afraid to express the idea today because, you know, we are, we are divided by, by you know, political populism, uh, the rise of Islamic uh, political movement, and it, I think, becomes one obstacle to uh, you know, to to create or to promulgate or to share new ideas on Islam, and I think it is one. Uh, it is it becomes one obstacle in our region uh, for many scholars, for example, to write on Islam and to share it to global publics. This is the first. The second is I will also share, I, and I will, I will also compare between Indonesia and Malaysia. You know, Malaysia, Malaysian scholar is easy to share the idea because you know Malaysian is is very familiar with English, you know, Dr. Uh, Dr. Khairuddin and Dr. Shasha. But Indonesian scholars are very, you know, need more struggle to, 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 to speak in English and to, to write in English. So uh, basically, there are so many uh, interesting works, work, for example, on Islam, and new ideas on Islam, for example, to be uh, introduced to global ummah. But uh, there is, you know, a language barrier. So there's actually a problem in, uh, from us. So I think uh, I really appreciate Dr. Hairuddin's work on it. So yeah, we are the same, yeah? Despite we are, dif we, are dip we are divided by Malaysia and Indonesia, I think, but we are the same Ummah. So I think it doesn't matter whether uh, this idea comes from Malaysian, Singaporean, or from Indonesia. So politics, I think, uh, becomes uh, one important pet, a factor that makes us still, you know, um, uh, understudied. So I think that's all. I'm sorry if uh, um, <laughs> I speak too long, uh, sister. Uh, I think that's all. And salam alaikum wa rahmatullahi No problem. Um, you're right on time again, alhamdulillah. Thank you uh, very much for sharing those thoughts, uh, Dr. Hasbi. Uh, so now, alhamdulillah, we come to the Q&A um, session uh, of the event. We've had several um, questions submitted in the Q&A box. Uh, we also have the option for attendees to raise their hands and pose their questions directly to the panel. If so, please raise your hand and, and I'll come to you and um, you can you will have the ability to unmute yourself. We also encourage our colloquium members, some of whom are here today as panelists, to you know raise your hand if you would like to um, unmute and pose the questions to the panel. However, just to start off, I think I want to pull a couple of questions that I was hearing from the respondents and put them to Dr. Saifuddin, um, sorry, Dr. Khairuddin. And of course, if Dr. Khairuddin would like to respond as well to some of the points that the respondents made, feel free. But one thing that I picked up from um, Dr. Shaza and Dr. Hasbi just raised it again now, is this um, is, is, is our definition of reform. And I think Dr. Shaza especially phrased it as, how do we balance the reform agenda with not getting carried away by all of the possible connotations that could be used under that umbrella term. Dr. Hasby mentioned how many people like to claim that banner of reformism, whether it's people on the more you know, ultra conservative side, if you want to look at Salafis or people on the, on the progressive end. So perhaps you could shed a little bit of, of, of light on that to get us started. Um, thank you very much for um, the, the, the very interesting questions and, and insights. I think I, I want to, um, in a sense, approach the questions one by one. We have, I think, two of the people listening in who wants to, who like to ask questions as well. I think I see Maria Han and Marek uh, raising their hands. But I want to, um, in a sense, take one question at a time and maybe look at the ones that was um, mentioned by Shaza and also um, by, by Hasbi. And I think the first issue is the issue of this absolutist mindsets, which has resulted to a lot of fear in the sharing of ideas. Um, and the reason why basically I wrote about these seven thinkers is because they actually exudes a lot of courage. They were very courageous people who lived in Suharto's uh, regime. They were also uh, were, were in Malaysia. Uh, Siza Majul Adib, for example, in the end fled uh, the Philippines because of the repression during the Marcos regime. So all of these thinkers were in 
places where states and societies were not willing to accept reformist ideas. Uh, but they said it anyhow. They wrote about their ideas because at their overriding concern was to change and reform society. So I think we need to begin by saying that if anyone wants to take the mantle of reforming society, uh, he or she must first show or have the courage to speak up and to express what he or she think as appropriate for that society. And I think this is where many of these thinkers are special to me uh, because they knew of the implications of what they were going to say, but they said it anyhow. And I think all of us, one way or another, has to make that, that, that kind of decision if we so decide to take on the mantle of wanting to reform society. Now, that leads me to the second point on the whole definition of reformism, why I use the, the Muslim or Islamic reformist mosaic. Now, when we talk about concepts, there are basically three kinds of concepts. The first is what we call as a philosophical concept, a concept that tries to understand ideas in its idyllic form. It, these are concepts that may not reflect reality, like the concept of democracy that was explained by the philosophers of the past. When many of these old philosophers talk about um, democracy, uh, they are talking about an idyllic idea of what democracy is. Or when Ibn al-Farabi, or when al-Farabi talks about the al-Madina al-Fadila, there was no al-Madina al-Fadila. It was a, a state that he envisioned uh, to be created in one way or another. And then there's what we call as a prescriptive concept, a concept that prescribes what ought to be done. And this is more of an activistic kind of concept. And then the third one is an analytical, analytical concept. So what I'm trying to do in the book is to introduce an analytical concept for us to try and, and understand how these reformists did their work and how then can we understand them as a whole. So my contribution is to analyze what they have thought. And in offering this concept, as I explained in the very beginning, I made sure that I do not depart from what they expressed, their ideas, but more importantly, on how we understand Islamic reformism as a whole. The only contribution that I have basically in this whole idea is the, to introduce mosaic into the idea of what Islamic reformism is, to understand re Islamic reformism in a more grounded and in a more nuanced way than how we have understood it from a philosophical perspective. So what I'm trying to do in the book is to take a philosophical concept and to turn it into an analytical one without trying to prescribe anything. Because once you get into this whole prescriptive conceptual mode, then I am doing the work of uh, re uh, reforming society, which I am not interested in right now, uh, at least in the book. But what I'm trying to show is that we can actually derive a lot of uh, good ideas from these uh, scholars and use this, these ideas to reform our society in the manner to which we interpret it. That leads me then to the, to the, to the choice or to the selection of thinkers. Uh, I wrote in, in my book in page seven that there are so many thinkers, especially in Indonesia that we can choose from. I have wrote about Azra, uh, pa, uh, Azu, uh, uh, pa Azra Azumardi in my earlier book, Muslim Cosmopolitanism. There's one chapter on him, uh, but there are many others that we can look at like Imam Zarkashi, Suryani Tahir, Ahmad Sun Haji, who was an exegete of the Quran, Ismail Lutfi uh, in South Thailand. There, there are thousands of really great thinkers in Southeast Asia. Uh, we can even look at the works of Quraish Shihab, for example, even if we disagree with him, he has written a lot wanting to give a new interpretation of the Quran. Uh, and I chose these seven because their thinking reflect the different strands that I feel had have or have had some impact on how we view uh, the, the ideas that are floating out there in society. So that was the reason for my selection. Now that then we talk about Harun Nas Nasution. Now I've read all of Pak Harun's books um, for, for the purposes of this book. Before we understand or before we call Pak Harun a Mu'tazilit, 
we first need to understand what Mu'tazila is all about, the Mu'tazilit thought is all about. And it is clear that the Mu'tazilits agree that the Quran is makhluk. The Mu'tazilits have certain concepts that determine what it means to be a Mu'tazilit. And one of the key concepts for the Mu'tazilits uh, is the concept of Adil. And of course, the Mu'tazilits also disagree on matters of how to interpret the essence of God. Now, when we look at all the criteria of being a Mu'tazilit uh, uh, was, and Harun Pak Harun also discussed this as well, he did not actually follow a lot of the maxims of the Mu'tazilits. In fact, in many of the, his own writings, he uh, criticized the Mu'tazilits for being oppressive, for being political, for turning what would have been only an intellectual project to become a political project. So I said in the book that uh, Pak Harun Nasution was not a Mu'tazilit, he was a methodological Mu'tazilit. Someone who uses Mu'tazilit thought in order to criticize the state of thought during his time. And indeed, he was not the only one who actually used the works of Mutazila, of the Mutazila. Even Hamka, in his Tafsir Al Azhar, which we all read in Southeast Asia or at least are exposed to, actually took a lot from the works of Zamakshari in the writing of his Tafsir. So he and, and Harun Asution actually shared a lot of co communalities. The only difference is that Harun Asustyon was very much influenced by Muhammad Abduh. Muhammad Abduh was very much influenced by the Mu'tazilids, especially uh, uh, Abdul Jabbar, the works of Abdul Jabbar. And they used the works of these thinkers in order to push forth a reform agenda. I mentioned in the book that Pak Harun was really more of someone who tries to reinterpret the Quran and Sunnah. And that even if people claim, and there was a lot of attacks against him when he was alive, uh, that he, he is a Mu'tazilit. Uh, one can say that he's a new Mu'tazila, but I would say that he did not qualify uh, or he could not fit in into what a Mu'tazilit uh, should be or should have been. So the, method, the methodological Mu'tazilit position that he took uh, put him in a kind of precarious position in the society that he was in then. But still, he becomes an interesting thinker for us to look at as someone who promotes this rationality, what he calls as Islam rational, rational uh, in order to reform society. Uh, other than that, I think that is all the point by Shaza about Islam becoming an identity marker rather than a way of life. Yeah, it has, it has become more and more the case uh, recently. The form is emphasized more than the substance. Uh, and when we talk about Islam, it's always about the expression of Islam in the, phys in the physicality, uh, but less in, 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 in the ideational uh, part. And I think our task as scholars is actually to bring people back to the thinking about Islam in order for Islam to be reformed and for it to be expressed uh, as, as a way of life. So I think I, I will stop here for now. Maybe uh, we can open up for anyone who wants to yeah, come in and ask questions. Yes. That'd be great. Thank you, Dr. Khairuddin. Um, we have some, several submitted written questions and we have a couple of hands up. Let's do the hands first and then we'll come to the written questions, inshallah. So we'll first go to uh, the audience member and then we'll come to you, um, Dr. Surya. But Marek uh, Muran, you should be able to unmute yourself and ask your question now. Yes, can, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can okay. hear you. And my name is Marek Moran. I'm uh, from Poland. I'm the member of the Muslim Religious Union uh, of, uh, of Poland and also a professor academician at the Jagiellonian University in Krakow. Um, two quick questions because of time. Number one, what, it, what do you think is the role in shaping of Islam in, in Indonesia of the Nusantara Islam? I was in December in Indonesia and uh, had a number of meetings with the Nakhladul Ulema, um, the university. So I would be uh, uh, interested uh, to know what you think is the influence of this Nusantara Islam. I myself represent the European Islam. European Islam is the Islam which is in Central and South Europe for 600 years. Not many people know, know, uh, know uh, 
about it. In fact, in May last year, I don't know if you can see me also, I organized in the European Parliament a seminar, um, a, a, a European Islam in Central and South, and South Europe. Uh, so that was the first time that we could have a voice and say that Islam in Europe is not what we have in France, uh, Germany, so that is one thing. But we have for 600 years, the most small communities uh, agreed, but we are here for, six, for 600 years. So this is one thing. So that question. Another question. Do you think uh, that the debate and information exchange um, uh, between the Southeast uh, Asia, Indonesia, Malaysia, uh, uh, and the European Union uh, on Islam is sufficient? Um, I just came yesterday from Bahrain, and uh, there was a conference of European uh, Union uh, and Bahrain on the uh, uh, conference on the freedom of religion. Very good event. Very good event. Do you think we could organize, we could try to organize a team that would follow and promote the idea of organizing such an event between the EU Parliament and uh, Southeast Asia? So that is very quick. I have also submitted my email number. I would be much obliged for the uh, Umatic Institute if you could give the email, email my email address to the to, uh, to the panelists, I would be very happy and glad to continue this discussion uh, on the main. Thank you very much. I understand time is very, very limited. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Marek, um, for raising those points. Um, over to um, the panelists on the first question on Nusantara Islam. Anybody would like to start off with that? Go ahead, Dr. Redi. Yeah, maybe Saifuddin and Hasbi and Shaza, you want to respond on the, the concept of Nusantara Islam? Yeah, let me first, right, uh, okay, uh, so Nusantara Islam is actually, you know, uh, not a new idea, it comes, I think, it was introduced by, um, like, um, uh, uh, Abdurrahman Wahid, the late Abdurrahman Wahid, Almarhum Abdurrahman Wahid, and, but especially in 2015, it was introduced by, it was become, you know, a new brand of Nyahdat Nahdatul Ulama, uh, to introduce a new version or, or, or a unique Indonesian version of Islam uh, to, you know, that uh, it it was, uh, it becomes a new mission for Naratul Ulama to share Indonesian experience, uh, to, to share peace, to create peace, to create tolerance in this world. But uh, the main problem until today is that this concept is still, uh, you know, becoming dispute, becoming controversy, in, controversy in, 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 in the internal of uh, Nadatul Ulama because, you know, it comes from the elite of Nadatul Ulama, but it was rejected by many uh, Kiai or many uh, scholars, traditional scholars in, in Nadatul Ulama. So, you know, I, I don't know that's how, I, I don't know how, it, uh, Sorry, uh, but I don't see that there is, you know, significant significant development of this this idea in Indonesia today. But you know, um, as you know, that uh, Nadr Ulama and the current regime, you know, is uh, working together in this, you know, in in this in this regime. So Nadr Ulama is now becoming, uh, you know, a, a tool for uh, the government diplomacy cooperating with Nadr Ulama to share. Indonesian version of Islam, but you know it remains still controversy inside Nadatul Ulama. So the first, the second, the second uh, that the second is uh, the the notion of uh, Islam Nusantara now is still understood as the Nadatul Ulama version of Islam. So it is not still recognized as a Muslim or Indonesian Muslim version of Islam because, as you know that. Uh, we have not only Nadatul Ulama here in Indonesia, but we have also uh, Muhammadiyah who promotes uh, Islam ber Islam berkemajuan or uh, the progressive Muslim, for example. So it becomes it, it also uh, becomes a, a new uh, problems to to to, know, to 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 introduce Indonesian version of Islam, for example. So it is now still becoming a very uh, uh, intense discussion. In Indonesia, and but you know, but uh, because of Nahdlatul Ulama is uh, you know is very close to our gym, our government today, so Islam Nusantara becomes a brand to 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 you know to engage with other Muslim uh, around the world. 
maybe Dr. Saifuddin want to uh, add something, for example. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you for this time. Um, I'm thinking that I have no many things to talk, uh, to comment on Islam Nusantara. As you said before, uh, this question, I mean, I don't know how to comment it. It's really like, you know, brand, uh, Indonesian brand of Islam. So now um, I just, when I took, uh, when I took uh, to write about Islam, Nusantara in Indonesia, uh, I try to find what is the root of Islam Nusantara. So in my opinion, I refer to the historical uh, artifact like uh, what uh, there in Sur Aceh, like uh, uh, Samudra Pasai. And uh, I did my research on it and I find, for example, uh, this is on my argument, so not what not, not what happened as uh, Sheikh Herudin said. The ideal Islam Nusantara that I offer that is based on the first Islam as the civilization in Southeast Asia, and I offer what uh, Nusan, uh, what uh, uh, Samudra Pasai Islam it was, and uh, I wrote about uh, what is the kind of Akida there, the stream of Akida or. Tawhid and the, the Fiki and also the Shi'ar. Three things that I found on Samudra Pasai and I propose this is a kind of Islam Nusantara. And in many ways, uh, in many ways that the Islam that uh, Isantara that I found on Samudra Pasai artifacts is uh, 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 some way uh, different to uh, what Islam Nusantara uh, I mean uh, proposed by now in Indonesia. But uh, in many ways, there is the, uh, the what communal, I mean, the, 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 the point, I mean, the meeting point between Islam and Santara that I propose and what is uh, in reality now is the same what uh, Sheikh Karudin said in the idea of cosmo cosmopolitanism. Uh, Islam in Southeast Asia is uh, uh, more cosmopolitanism than Islam that we know uh, in the central Islam. For example, we we are more like she are like cultural markers and something like what we say the tradition or other something like that and uh, maybe uh, the idea of makasit sharia that is based on cultural markers in indonesian context or in southeast asia context much uh, better than what we know in arabic uh, uh, tradition because uh, in islam in, in southeast asia there are uh, many uh, idea, many traditions, many cultural markers that meet together. Even many people from the every part of the world come together here to develop and to uh, to create Islam here. That that it has um, uh, distinctive to uh, center of Islam. For example, in Arabic, in Arab countries, or in Persian way, Islam here is everything is here. So it's really cosmopolitanism and. Uh, Herodin, Sheikh Herodin, writing on cosmopolitanism is really uh, important either to understand of uh, Islam Nusantara for me. And I think uh, it is time for us to give more contribution to develop this concept of Islam Nusantara to be more realistic and more, I uh, mean, has root to uh, history, for example, like Samudra Pasai and Malacca in Malaysia and in Patani, there were also uh, uh, what it calls a uh, sultanate of Islam, so something like that. For me, a historical approach to understand Islamic Nusantara is much better than by using anthropo I mean, uh, anthropological way in, in current time. That's my idea, uh, ask me and uh, my friend, thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you, Dr. Saifuddin. If um. Dr. Shaza, Dr. Khaydadeen, don't profess to come in onto this question. We can go to Dr. Surya and then inshallah bring you in. Um, Dr. Surya, go ahead. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Wa alaikum salam. Uh, it's raining uh, here. I'm at the train station, so I hope you can hear me. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Bro Hairuddin, for an enlightening presentation. 
I would like to follow up with uh, the previous question. So I understand the title of your book is Shepherds of Islam. Uh, and then uh, the content is about thinkers from especially Southeast Asia. But if you are in the region long enough, you will find that individual thinkers have very, uh, let's say at most moderate influence at the shaping of or the molding of Muslims here. Uh, the Muslims uh, in this region, I think especially in Indonesia are very much influenced, very much part of mass organizations as the aforementioned uh, 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 questioner said, Nahdlatul Ulama, Muhammadiyah, Yosef al Waslia, we have Persis, we have Front Pembela Islam, and so on and so forth. And these uh, mass organizations have, between the both of them, I think 100 plus million members, perhaps 150, with Nahdlatul Ulama 100 million members and uh, Muhammadiyah 50 million members. And they also have branches, uh, uh, foreign branches uh, uh, in uh, uh, wherever Indonesians are residing or studying. So they have a United States branches, they have an Australian branch. In fact, Muhammadiyah just opened a school, a mosque, and I think a market, the 3M combination, right? Mosque, market, and madrasa in uh, Australia and they're opening another one in Japan and so on and so forth. So, uh, bro, Hairudin, my point is, if you look at all the thinkers uh, you mentioned in your book, uh, and then if you ask the average Indonesian, uh, they would know uh, them, but in terms of how they act, how they think, how they uh, write, how they behave, all this, I think they are very much influenced by the organization. So my invitation is uh, for a companion book, which is, uh, uh, I have uh, said in the chat, Molders of Muslims, uh, mass organizations and their multi-million members. Because, uh, for example, let me give you one example. Yeah? Muhammadiyah came up with this idea, Darul Ahdi wa Shahada which is in direct uh, relevance to the whole umatics enterprise. And when you read this conception of state, yeah, uh, so Muhammadiyah treats the state, the Indonesian state as Darul Ahdi wa Shahada, the place of uh, unity and witnessing, for example. And you will find that if you read the organizational uh, what do you call it, uh, uh, paper, for example, on this, you'll see that it is very much influenced by one thinker, which is Din Shamsuddin. So what I'm saying, what I'm trying to say is, it's very interesting that uh, you have uh, these organizations and these major positions, which are adhered to by hundreds of millions of members, like Rohairudin perhaps, or other others in the in the uh, in this uh, in this uh, colloquium to follow up with this in regards to the region uh, another anecdote that i can say is i'm very surprised to find for example jamaah tablik which is huge in india pakistan and bangladesh they just split up uh, or they split up a few years ago into like at least two factions so i think these uh, are very important too we can just wrap up your question i think so I think these are very important too, in terms of uh, our Umatics project. Thank you very much. Okay, great yeah. question. Dr. Khaitin, over to you and then we'll come yeah, to you. Yeah, uh, an excellent point by uh, Surya. Uh, but very quickly, actually, again, go back to the selection of thinkers. Zakia Darajat was uh, one of the leaders of the MUE the Majlis Ulama Indonesia. In fact, she was the first woman to be part of the Majlis Ulama Indonesia. So, and she was actually affiliated to Muhammadiyah as well. Uh, Siza Adib Majul was very close to the Moro Islamic movement. In fact, he was part of the 
uh, mediators between the state and the Moro movement in Malaysia. And the same is it with Punto Wijoyo, who's very interesting because his parents were both Nahdlatul Ulama and Muhammadiyah. Punto Wijoyo was one of the grassroots leader of Muhammadiyah in Yogyakarta. Ahmad Ibrahim was not much of a mass movement leader, but he certainly influenced a lot of um, thinkers in Malaysia who were involved in mass movements. Harun Asusyan also was a bit like Ahmad Ibrahim, was very much involved in university and in institutions. But if you talk to Indonesians who have been to the EIEN, many of them have read the ideas of Harun Asusyan. And of course, the interesting thing about Harun Asusyan was that his books were very easy to read. To read. Uh, it was written very, very simply and they were very much popular. Osman Bakar was part of ABIM, Angkatan Belia Islam Malaysia, and Nak Naqib al -Atas was actually an idolog of many movements in Malaysia. In fact, if you travel to Malaysia today and you talk about Naqib al -Atas, many of the movements, uh, leaders and, and, and movement uh, activists would have read his book one way or another. So again, when I selected these thinkers, they were very much involved in Islamic movements directly or indirectly. But I truly appreciate the point. Yeah, there are actually a lot of studies on Nahdlatul Ulama recently. Uh, there were a lot of studies on Muhammadiyah in the past, James Peacock, Professor Nakamura, and others. But we need more works on, on these movements. Not only the billion or the, sorry, the million uh, strong movements like Muhammadiyah and others and Persis and so forth and Abim, but we also need to look at micro movements. What's interesting uh, about this current youth population is that they don't like to join these big movements anymore. They don't like ke Muhammadiyahan or ke NUAN and so forth and so forth. They like to be part of micro movements, small movements doing small things, but making a big impact because uh, these small movements use a lot of the technologies that are out there. So digital, uh, digital activism and so forth and so forth. So again, we need to adjust our way of thinking of, of, uh, of influence and change from looking at those movements that are already so predominant to looking at those who are emerging. But we also need to look at how thinkers and scholars are now packed into many of these micro movements as well. So thank you very much. This is very, an, an excellent point that was brought up just now. I just want to go very quickly to the, to the question and answers. And... Um, I want to look at this question on this communication and debate between Southeast Asia and Islam and EU. I think it was uh, brought up by Marat. Um, I think we need to have another session, and I would like to, to um, suggest this to the Umatics group, of a conversation between European Islam, uh, Southeast Asian Islam probably, and Southeast Asian Islam. We need to discuss this as an Ummah, to talk about the same issues and topics. Uh, and I, I think it's an excellent idea that we need to have uh, this kind of cross-regional engagement where we can see then there are a lot of parallels in terms of ways of thinking. As mentioned just now, very nicely, that uh, Harun Asution was very much influenced by Egyptian, Egyptian thinkers during his time, uh, Abu Zahra, and so forth and so forth influences ideas. And the same is it with all the other thinkers. There were a lot of conversations between them and European thinkers as well. Uh, the late Ismail Faruqi, uh, Seth Hussein Nasser, and also others in America influenced a lot of these thinkers, especially Osman Bakar. Uh, Nakib Alatas engaged with a lot of the ideas of people like Ziauddin Sardar and others. So I think we need to get this, this thing going. And I hope, Marik, I uh, hope you, you get in touch with the Umatics group we will have another session, I, I really hope for it, probably a physical one uh, where different people from different regions can come together and share their ideas. Yeah. Inshallah, that sounds like a, a great suggestion, um, Dr. Khairuddin, and one that we'd be more than happy uh, to facilitate um, in the future, inshallah. Um, I think this session has really shown the importance of engaging in that transnational conversation and bringing in regional features onto a kind of more global stage and everybody contributing their experiences based on that. Um, I wanna just come back to the question raised by Dr. Surya, if Dr. Shaza um, or Dr. Hasbi or Dr. Saifuddin want to respond. I know some of you have, have written and done work on, on mass movements uh, in Indonesia. 
yes, excuse me, since the questions have been mostly uh, focused on, on, on Indonesia, yeah. it's not really my my area, but um, I do like uh, that, that point made by Dr. Surya about the idea of, of mass movement. And I think that's also kind of my question earlier on uh, in my uh, discussion, which is that you know, we have all of these great ideas, these great thinkers, reformers, and although Prof. Kaili already mentioned about and explained how they brought their ideas through their affiliations and works with uh, movements, but I still feel like that's the gap. Right, that the ideas maybe fall up to the movement level, but and then there's this gap from that movement to reach to the population. And for me, that gap is, for lack of a better word, worrying for me because that is the gap that uh, is used by politicians um, for one way or the other. So that is why I was thinking when I was reading the book as well, like how do we get all the way down to the masses, like all the way down, unfiltered? And it's difficult to think of, of a way. and. I know uh, Prof mentioned earlier that you know we need to be brave. It's encouraging to hear these words that we need to be brave. Scholars need to take uh, the lead in doing all of this. But we, I think that we can't ignore that at the end of the day, the general masses, the population, they they are not really connected to scholarship, to intellectuals. Um, you know, the colloquium such as this. This is. Uh, out of reach to most people, I could say, right? So it's unfortunate then, how, how do we link these two? And um, I want to bring it to the, 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 the discussion on this idea of pop Islam, right? It's not just that movement, like market, I think Dr. Surya mentioned the market part, the idea of pop Islam, popular Islam is, is, is utilized by different movements. Um, so that is why I think we're not seeing the whole picture of, of this uh, reform agenda in, in Southeast Asia. And, and for me, of course, I'm speaking specifically in Asia. So that's my, my, my two cents on that. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Hasby, would you like to come in on any of those points? Um, no, I think enough. But I, I, I would like to respond, I think, uh, Dr. Shaza, uh, uh, idea on pop Islam, you know, that uh, now in Indonesia today, uh, you know, so many uh, Muslim, uh, uh, you know, uh, youth influencer now doing or using TikTok or uh, Twitter or social media to, you know, to 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 do to do dakwah to the uh, Muslim Indonesia. And I think uh, there are so many, uh, you know, uh, new development of dakwah activities in Indonesia. And it is not uh, from traditional way of dakwah, but a very modern and using so many uh, modern, uh, you know, uh, 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 tool like social media and so on. I think it is actually a, a new, a new thing too. To that, uh, that I think interesting to be discussed in the future. I think that's all. Definitely, definitely. I think um, the frontiers of of Dawa uh, as per technology and increasingly even you know AI and the role that that would have on uh, producing Islamic content is going to be something we should also address in the future, most likely. Um, okay, we are coming towards the end of the session. We still have about 10 minutes left. So if there are any questions uh, from attendees who would like to raise their hand and, and, and ask their questions, uh, feel free. Uh, but aside from that, I think um, there are some questions perhaps in the chat box as well. Um, Dr. Hassamuddin, you've asked a question in the chat box. Would you like to pose your question directly? Perhaps you're not able to speak right now. It's just, it's quite long. Um, okay, never mind. Let's come back to some of the questions in the, in the Q&A box. Um, Rabia Brown says, uh, there, there, there are several titles um, that you mentioned, uh, Dr. Saifuddin. Could we, we get the titles of some of those? I think in your response, you were mentioning various books that you, or, or, or pieces that were influential um, among some prominent Muslim thinkers in Southeast Asia. Would you mind perhaps repeating those or what other recommendations you would have for people who would like to read more about this? Dr. Saifuddin, can you hear us? Okay, thank oh. you. No. Oh, yeah. Okay. So um, 
does it mean that uh, the question is about uh, the books that should be read to understand South East Asian Islam? Or yes, yes. The discourse between uh, trends of Islam in South East Asia. I think uh, the most prominent book that uh, should be read on South East Asia Islam is, uh, for me, I put my first priority to read uh, uh, Prof. Herudin books on cosmopolitan of Islam and also uh, Abdul Rahman Wahid book on cosmopolitan of Islam. Same book, but different side. And the second book that's uh, uh, really uh, uh, interesting, the, the interesting is the book of uh, Nokib al uh probably of Islam, and also how Nokib al try to revive uh, traditional thought on thought is a Islam, especially the thought of Hamza Fansuri and Nuruddin Nadari, which were uh, originated in uh, Achenis uh, Sultanate, that was uh, uh, took the role of the umbrella of Islam in South East Asia. And also, there are some other books that is really important for me because um. Uh, I took priority on I, my 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 reading is mostly on historical resource for for me uh, the the resource on uh, Samudra Pasai uh, studies is really important to understand the nature of Islam in South Asia because uh, the idea of Islam in South Asia is really the mix of all uh, 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 branch of Islam or uh, stream of Islam in in the world of Islam. So how this mix together of Islam came together to be new Islam in South Asia, and how this South Asia Islam become the cultural marker to Muslim in South Asia, which is uh, really neglected by the center of Islam as uh, uh, Heruddin uh, post uh, earlier. But as we say now, for example, uh, there is Islam, I mean, the kind of Islam thinking of uh, American Islam or European Islam and also like uh, Arabian Islam was uh, uh, received more attention from a scholar, but South East Asian Islam has been neglected. But in fact, for me, as the cultural, uh, uh, I mean, because I concerned about culture, uh, in the influence of Islamic culture in the world, I I see that South East Asia much better than all over the world. For example, hell, I mean, hijab. Uh, almost all of Muslim in South Asia use hijab as the cultural marker. They identify themselves of Islam by hijab, while in the other part of uh, Muslim world, hijab become, I mean, uh, not men's, I mean, not dominant cultural marker. And in South Asia, we see that some uh, women, he is like uh, artist or become like, uh, you know, so they, they use jilbab to to say that I'm Muslim. And also what he did as artist, something that not really Islam, but they tried to use it uh, a cultural marker. This is the first, the first thing that to understand Islam is South Asia. So cultural marker is uh, really uh, uh, the the gate to, to understand to understand South East Asian Islam. And the other book that should be read to understand South East Asian Islam is uh, the book of Azra for me and the book of Kunto uh, Geo maybe, and the other one, I think uh, not so much. Uh, I mean, it's really important, but uh, it comes uh, after that those book. And this is my <laughs> my thinking. Um, sorry for my. I mean, maybe it's, it's only my personal reference. And uh, thank you very much. No, those are all great suggestions, um, Dr. Saifuddin. Perhaps you could also write them in the webinar chat box and people will be able to search them more easily. Or of course the recording will be uploaded. So whoever missed it, you can um, you can go and watch the recording on YouTube. Uh, I have located now um, uh, Dr. Hassan Adin's question. So although we are a little bit high on time, let's, let's come to that because it's on Malaysia. And uh, as Dr. Shaza said, the conversation has been a little bit more Indonesia focused. So it's be interesting to bring that in. Um, 
So Dr. Hassan Adin asks to Dr. Khairuddin and the other respondents about the evaluation of the Kuala Lumpur summit that has gathered many prominent reformists. It's known as the meeting of Muslim political leaders of some Islamic majority countries and prominent intellectuals. It took place in Malaysia in December 2019 and aimed to provide a platform for Muslim countries to discuss common challenges and explore opportunities for cooperation in various areas. How do you find this event as something that can be built on, especially in the terms of Dr. Mahathir Muhammad's suggestion to use the gold dinar and barter trade among Muslim countries as an indication of some efforts to restore a nomadic system? We know that the event did not generate tangible outcomes due to the political circumstances, but how was the impact of these reformists, I'm assuming meaning some of the ones we've been discussing today, in general on the leaders of Muslim majority countries? It, we know the event did not generate any tangible outcome? Yes, that's the same question. Okay. So what was the impact of uh, some of the reformists that we've mentioned today on political leaders in Southeast Asia, and in particular, uh, on the proposals that were made at that conference in, in Malaysia in 2019? Yeah, if I, if I can respond very quickly, I think it was um, a, a noble effort at um, trying to discuss certain pertinent issues affecting the Ummah. The summit is much forgotten now. Nobody remembers that, that very iconic kind of uh, event. But I think a lot of the issues that were raised are things that are already ongoing. So for example, the gold dinar discussion, I think it's still um, up in the air. A lot of countries are also considering it. Uh, there are efforts already uh, in trying to do kind of like small trading in dinar. Um, but I think one of the problems that we see in our Ummah is that we tend to wait for political leaders to initiate such high-level discussions. And I think we need to move away from that. Uh, we don't have to wait for um, somebody prominent, a head of state, to start talking about these major issues for things to move forward. So if you look at a lot of the changes that has happened in Europe, for example, uh, they don't actually depend on political leaders to initiate them. Social movements, the civil society, activists, and so forth and so forth, they go on and, and discuss these issues and then make resolutions and start to effect changes in the little ways that they, they, they could. So I think um, it's said that the summit did not uh, live long enough. Uh, Martin Muhammad was later on uh, unseated from uh, his prime ministership the same is it with Imran Khan uh, in Pakistan. And I mean, these are things that would always happen uh, in the Ummah. Uh, you can read a very good book by, by this friend of mine who's here today, Alhamdulillah, uh, Usama's book on Islam and the Arab revolutions. I mean, seriously, um, we, we, if we depend too much on our leaders uh, to change the realities and only on high level kind of uh, scholars to to make changes, I uh, will not achieve much for ourselves. So we need to now take control of our destiny and start this kind of discussions and perhaps, you know, more, more good things are to come yeah, in the Ummah, inshallah. Inshallah. Um, any other respondents like to come in? Any final comments on that? Uh, I'll just give a, a few quick final thoughts on that. Um, for me, okay, first of all, I'm a bit conflicted uh, on the Kiara summit itself. Uh, I think one of the major problems with it is the objectives. Uh, on the surface, it, it, it talks about um, the coming of, of the Ummah and discussion of challenges of the Muslim world, etc. But we can see that beyond that is much more of a political project, right? No one can deny that it's a political project uh, of certain Muslim countries is a counter hegemonic project, both against uh, counter hegemonic against the West, counter hegemonic against uh, Saudi led bloc, whatever you want to call it. So that's the political aspect to the KL summit in 2019. So for me, with that objective itself, it it is is bound to fail. And unfortunately, I think because it doesn't have the larger additional purpose of creating is this ummah mindset or you know forming together coming together the entire ummah so that's one thing another thing is uh of what uh prof just mentioned earlier so this is why i i, I get conflicted because although i agree that yes we need to kind of 
take matters into our own, own hand. We can't wait for our statesmen to do it because, like I said, when you bring in political persons, elites, it becomes an, a different animal on its own. So it can't be depend on we should take uh, matters into our own hand. However, I feel like without um, allies in the political spheres, elites, it's a bit more difficult to push forward the agenda. It can be done. Uh, it's more steps, baby steps. If we're patient, and, and I, I'm kind of patient, so we can do that. But I think some Muslims are uh, a bit impatient. They want the changes to happen now. And I think to do that, like it or not, somehow we need that buy-in from the political leaders. So that's my uh, final words. Thank you very much. And uh, any final comments, Dr. Hasbi, Dr. Saifuddin, not necessarily on this question, but just before we, we wrap up? All uh, right, uh, let me, um, yeah, um, I want to uh, reflect one thing uh, from Indonesian uh, problem, of his, problem of history, that uh, we are lack actually of documentation uh, from many uh, ideas, from many figures, or from, from, from many things of our history. And I think the work that is done by Dr. Harudin, I think it is, it is, it is a good tradition to, to be to be to be done to be continued uh, to be uh, because you know that uh, there are so many ideas that actually is needed to be explored needs, need, needed to be introduced and uh, to make it long lasting we have to uh, make a good documentation on it I think this is to enrich uh, you know this to enrich the idea of the ummah so uh, all of the Muslim in in this world can you know can learn can get the benefit from that. And I think it must be from documentation. So I think we can uh, we can support, we have to support this work. And I think we, uh, as intellectuals, as academics, I think we need to uh, also uh, take part for this, uh, for this work. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Wa alaikum salam. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi Just, um... I wanted to take the opportunity again to give salam to uh, Professor Hayruddin. It's been a long time. So, Jazakumullah Khan also is mentioning my book. I, I think, um, uh, and I apologize, I missed the first half of this because uh, I had uh, a class I was teaching. So, I, I was only able to join in the second half. But, um, uh, you know, I look forward to watching the replay and also uh, reading the book. Um, but I, I think the role of the ulama as kind of discursive. Um, generators of discourse, in a sense, uh, alongside academics uh, is going to be an interesting dynamic to look at. And I think um, ulama networks across the world, trans-regionally, um, are, you know, are a space where um, investigations, I don't know to what extent you explore this in your book, but, um, you know, that, that also is, inshallah, a, a opportune space for this sort of discourse to develop that can be counter-hegemonic and ultimately the a bottom-up influence of the political classes can take place through that each other. Barakulafi. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Osama. It's um, good to see you, alhamdulillah. Um, Dr. Saifuddin, you had unmuted. Would you like to just give some final comments before we end? Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I think that the sort of has a very rich idea of Islamic thought. But the problem is the idea of Islamic thought in Indonesia, in, in South Indonesia, mostly lack of uh, hard evidence. So uh, I think that it is good for, uh, for every Muslim or for scholars to find hard evidence of Islam in South Indonesia because of uh, the study on, for especially on history, on earliest history of Islam, for example, on gravestone of Samudra Pasa in Malacca and on archaeological Islam, I mean, by using Islamic approach of archaeology, is really uh, has under uh, concern by Muslim by scholars and has little attention for many of uh, uh, scholars. So that when they uh, try to put um, Islam as the reality in South Asia, has no uh, strong evidence, has no uh, strong ground. So this is my my concern, and I I I ask for everyone if we can uh, cross on Islam to bring Islam in 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 light in Sudan by using 
uh, historical evidence because it's really important. And second thing that is my final forward uh, uh, word is really to say thank you for Umatik uh, Institute for uh, being me in this part of a really prestigious event and uh, really happy uh, to meet Professor Khairuddin and Chaza Shukri and Hasbi and all other friends here and for Aisha, thank you very much. And it's really happy to be part of this program in the next time. Please let me know by email or by anything for the, for the next program. Uh, really to, I mean, to give my, my time for this event. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Saifuddin, and Jazakallah khair to all of our speakers today. It's been a really, really fascinating conversation. Uh, and for all of our attendees as well who participated um, in, the, in, in, in the question and answer box and people who posed their questions directly to the panel. Um, before everybody goes, if you have not already, we would like to encourage you to please subscribe to our newsletter on our website, omatics.org, in order to receive updates about our upcoming events and colloquiums. And you can also keep updated with our articles and our future events via our social media channels. Um, we look forward to, inshallah, having our next session, not uh, next month in June, uh, as we will be having our first symposium in Istanbul. And for anybody who will be in Turkey uh, in the middle of June, next uh, in, in the middle of next month, feel free to check out our website for the details of that event uh, and get in touch with us if you are interested in attending. Uh, so inshallah, we will see everybody at our next online event in, in July, inshallah. Uh, thank you once again to all of our speakers. Uh, have a great afternoon, evening, morning, wherever you are in the world. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh.